healthy, not walk on water healthy, but somewhat healthy. No medical exams. You know, they're not writing to the doctors. They're just asking you some questions over the phone. But if you really want to take a look at something that's amazing, you all, I know all our listeners out there have money sitting in the bank earning nothing. You have money in money market accounts earning nothing. You have money in old fixed annuities earning nothing. When I say nothing, negligible returns. Let's say you take me on faith value that you do this. You got a money back guarantee. If we sit down after one year and it doesn't perform exactly the way I'm telling you it will, you can get your money back. But nobody does because this will set you free. It's called the non annuity. I wrote a book about it called The Financial Fortress. In that book, there's tons of examples of some implications of how you can use this. And also, I talk about actual annuities and other investments. Once again, I want to give out a, a number 954 295 73 Two seven, and that's the non-annuity. Now, there is a version of the non-annuity which builds up a little less death benefit and a little less cash value, and, and it depends on your age, you know, what that little less actually equates to, but it has a long-term care benefit. And you might want to look into that because it's a great way to get long-term care. It's real long-term care, and it's a great way to get it with some of that lazy money that you have rolling around. But both versions of the non-annuity are really something you should look into. We're going to talk more in future shows about some other examples because people are always asking me, Lee, I'm a business owner. Can I use a non-annuity in my business? Uh, can I use it for uh, buy-sell agreements? Can I use it for other things? Yes, you can. Till next time, thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you for listening to Smart Money with Lee Berlin and Gary Polk. For a free consultation at any of Strategic Wealth Advisors South Florida offices, call Gary Polk at Strategic Wealth Advisors at 954-295-7327. Again, that's 954-295-7327. Radio listeners who call will receive a copy of The Financial Fortress and free access to the newsletter. We invite you to call. And of course, join us next time for more Smart Money. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Talk 1470, WWNN, Pompano Beach, Boca Raton, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Listen Sundays at noon for Be a Catholic with topics like the high horse of morality, Catholicism on AM 1470 WNN. Talk health, talk wealth, talk politics. Talk 1470 WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. The content of the following program, including all statements from the hosts and guests, is to provide general information and commentary about the law. Under no circumstances does any statement made by the host or guest to a caller or listener constitute legal advice or the formation of an attorney-client relationship, and the material from this program shall not be viewed as substitute for a personal consultation with an attorney. Now, prepare yourself to be informed and entertained by Gus Bravo and Neil Kotze, two AV-rated trial lawyers who have been practicing law for a combined total of nearly 40 years. For the next 30 minutes, they will share their insight and commentary on important legal issues affecting all of us. Two representatives from the United Way are sitting in the law offices of a very prominent South Florida attorney. They're there because this South Florida attorney has never given to the United Way. And one of the representatives turns to him and says, Mr. Jones, we know that you make millions of dollars a year and yet you've never given to the United Way. And Mr. Jones, the attorney, looks at these two representatives and said, so you did research to see that I make millions of dollars a year. And the representative says, yes, we did that research. He says, did your research also show that my mother has just been recently diagnosed with a rare blood disorder that's going to require hundreds of thousands of dollars to treat and she has no insurance? And the United Way rep said, no, I'm sorry, our research didn't show that. Mr. Jones said, did your research also show that my brother passed away two months ago and his widow, 
My sister-in-law is trying to raise three children, my nieces and nephews, with no money, my brother left them no insurance, and she desperately needs help. Did your research show you that? And the United Way rep said, no, I'm sorry, our research didn't show us that either. And the lawyer looked at them and said, so let me ask you this. If I'm not giving money to either of them, what makes you think I'm going to give money to you? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Attorney Confidential. I'm Neil Kotze. <laughs> and I'm Gus Bravo. Are you sure Mr. Jones is not really Mr. Kotze? <laughs> no. Well, no, because Mr. Jones made millions of dollars a year. So by definition... Not the fact that you wouldn't give to your mother. No, your no, I'd always give to my parents. Well, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for that joke. Uh, you know, they're getting a little bit better, but uh, okay. Well, thank you, guys. I, I know glad, you're starting to run out of that. I'm glad I meet with the Bravo seal of approval. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's a very low threshold, right. trust me. Uh, anyways, Attorney Confidential with Gus and Neil, we welcome your phone calls, 888-565-1470. Any questions you might have, uh, you can also watch us live on Ustream.tv or listen to us on the iRadio Now app. Uh, or you can tweet us at Bravo underscore law uh, and then Facebook us at the Attorney, Attorney Confidential. Confidential with Gus and Neil. I think very easy to find. There you go. I don't know if any other mediums. I guess we have to find other LinkedIn. social. LinkedIn. That's true. <laughs> I know we have a LinkedIn page, so I think each of us post on LinkedIn. Yeah, you can find us on LinkedIn, right. and we, we talk about ourselves there as well. Uh, well, look before we jump into. I don't know. If we really have a topic, but the major headlines this weekend. This weekend was another one of those wonderful sports. Weekends. <laughs> I had a you were talking more about FIFA, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, there's just a whole thing. So, first of all, we have the NBA Finals, which any self respecting Miami Heat fan is rooting for the Golden State Warriors, of <laughs> course. Uh, and unfortunately, last night, they, the, the Cavs tied it up, um, and, and no one gave them a chance. Uh, so, you know, kudos to LeBron. We hope he makes it close, but we hope the title goes to Golden State. Not that we're bitter about the way he departed us, but, uh, you know. Uh, the other thing, the other sporting event this week, and we had also the uh, Champions League final, which I'm sure you were watching, FC Barcelona against Juventus. Neil, Saturday, no? No. No? Okay. No. I, 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 I was watching the horse race. Well, I'm going <laughs> to get to that in there. a second one. So we had the uh, Barcelona won their title, and, and, you know, another title for Messi. That team is just wonderful. The third sporting event this weekend is actually the World Cup, the Women's World Cup. I don't know if you've been paying attention I've tonight. The that, U.S. plays at 7.30 in the opening game of their opening game, Women's World Cup. It started actually on Saturday, which leads a nice segue to FIFA. Right. Now, now I will say, though, I, women's soccer being a Tar Heel, I'm very proud of women's soccer yes. because our Tar Heels, Absolutely, very University good. of North Carolina, has won him. like 15 of the last 18 championships. It's some ridiculous statistic yes back back in the day uh, Mia Hamm and those right. folks they were they were completely unstoppable but I didn't interrupt you so, back no, to FIFA. so FIFA FIFA uh, Sepp Blatter finally had the decency to step down last Tuesday uh, the rumor is that he's going to be knee-deep in investigations because as you know these how these inv investigations go they start getting the associates and they start trying to cut deals with the associates in exchange for information f uh, uh, that they're going to turn against the bigger fish in absolutely this case. and and now the, and i'm sure you're gonna get to the legal issues are going to escalate because now you're dealing with russia and qatar is going to have some legal issues you're going to have appeals out the wazoo if we can say wazoo <laughs> here, I yeah i'm sure wazoo is <laughs> sure wazoo perfectly is okay. fine right. for the five people out there listening <laughs> wazoo yeah there, there's this this like i said last week this is just the tip of the iceberg with 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 fifa right. so now we get to i think the the, the the biggest sporting event of the weekend which was the triple crown and did you actually watch that? I absolutely had to make sure the TV was set. I wanted to see that. I mean, that's history. We haven't had one since 1978. That's correct. Were you alive in 1978? I was four years old. Four years old. You wow. were in college. <laughs> no? <laughs> Close that's to 12. it. Uh, um, American Pharaoh became just the 12th, speaking of 12th, 12th Triple Crown uh, winner, which is an impressive feat. But what I thought was interesting, and this is to me just because I'm obviously I'm a sports junkie, was... Rarely will you get an event where practically all the spectators are actually rooting for the same outcome, right? You had 90,000 plus people all rooting for the one horse to win. Right, except for the owners of maybe a couple of other horses. Yeah, but well, it's just <laughs> a small minority. Exactly. I mean, look, no, you have NBA Finals, Cavs fans, you know, Warriors. Well, you have the, the owner, uh, Secretariat's owner was there. And, Correct. And uh, she was clearly rooting to see, even though... Her horse has been one of the few. They they want to see a triple crown. If you're a fan of horse racing, it's so Absolutely. rare. 
is something you really want to see. Right. I thought it was really effective. And, and, well, it's interesting. Two, two quick tidbits, then we'll get to some other headlines. Number one, American Pharaoh is actually misspelled. I don't know if you picked right, that up. I did. Well, I'm an Egyptian. <laughs> my father's Egyptian. Yes, I, although I did flunk spelling for grade. I, Pharaoh is a word I... Yes, it's misspelled, but that, that actually gives it a little bit of more, uh, I guess, some, some something from the history books, right? And the second in interesting uh, fact that came out of it is that there were over 90,000 two dollar win tickets that went <laughs> unclaimed <laughs> because the two dollars for two dollars of the win ticket you would get three dollars and fifty cents back exactly so what folks are doing and doing it is obviously they're 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 preserving saving it for that's for interesting posterity. so one hundred eighty thousand dollars goes to the house actually more more because it's to three three fifty payout plus the two dollars they're gonna see what i mean you, well you that's get, right they save the payout it's over three hundred actually the article is right here it's over three hundred fifteen thousand dollars unclaimed two dollar tickets because they want it for posterity's sake to show that they that and there are some also very shrewd folks that are actually offering them all for sale on ebay <laughs> and they're getting, asking for 35 bucks a pop <laughs> listen this oh, is capitalism God. at its best oh, right never underestimate ca oh wow <laughs> so look those are the, the to me the sporting headlines i know you have a couple of other i think there was just one headline in well, particular, a couple of interesting legal headlines, Supreme and Court we're going to get the Supreme Court opinion. More I mean, meat to the bones. I exactly. I mean, one of the things that I noticed, and actually I'll start with the local first. There's a lawsuit going on down the road in Plantation, or I guess up the road, depending on where you're listening to us from. But Plantation is probably about the center point, and it's where Gus and I actually have our offices. But City nice Hall plug. is actually like uh, yes. suing uh, <laughs> the uh, Hyatt family, not the people that own the hotel chain, but Mark and Kathy Hyatt, because of their extreme, allegedly extreme Christmas display. And uh, what's interesting is apparently this is, it, the neighbors are complaining and it's so extreme that they're suing them for all sorts of violations. The of city is? The city, and it's a civil lawsuit. It's not, they're not issuing citations. It's a civil lawsuit. And what I thought was interesting, and, and those of you listening can go and Google the case and find out more about it and see pictures of these Christmas lights, which... Goodness gracious! <laughs> it, it, we couldn't put them on the air because they would blind us, and we wouldn't be able Did to finish see the, the show. Pictures? I, yes, I could imagine. Well, listen, is, there are uh, some people that really go all out and and the extreme. But 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 so what? But I, what I thought was interesting about this particular lawsuit was it provides a perfect example of something we've discussed before on this show: is how expensive it is to litigate. The city has already spent in the one year of litigation. Sixty thousand wow. dollars in legal fees, and they haven't yet taken a deposition. Are you serious? <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. Now, I don't know what they've spent it on. I can surmise you the mean motions the city, practice. The city hired probably hired Private an outside lawyers, firm, and they've spent sixty thousand in legal fees. The Hyatts are not disclosing how much they've spent to defend, but it gives you a perfect example. I mean, here's a case which everybody's kind of laughing about and thinking, "Wow, what's this?" But then they've spent sixty thousand dollars in legal fees. So between the two of them, they've probably broken a hundred. So, easy. so for those of you that live in plantation, that's where your, tax your money hard earned tax dollars at is work. going to fight a Christmas tree. Unbelievable! It is unbelievable. And and so that was I thought an interesting thing in the news. And then um, the Supreme Court just issued an interesting opinion. And I'm I think I'll pronounce this correctly in these. Now Zitowski that's not a case. Wikipedia no, printout. I pulled the Supreme Court opinion. Yes, I now, this is actually the uh, Supreme syllabus. Court syllabus. Which is, it, when the Supreme Court issues an opinion, they summarize it for people that don't feel like reading the 110-page the Idiot's version. Guide to the Supreme <laughs> Court opinion, right? <laughs> it's Supreme Court for dummies, yes. Uh, but it's an interesting case in light of all that's been going on with this administration and their relationship with Israel. Uh, oh, easy now. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, a slight plug <laughs> thing for my political views. But the uh, about a year ago... A young lad, 12 years old, his parents sued... I'm sorry, did you just say lad? Lad, yes. <laughs> <laughs> is he Irish? <laughs> well, that's true. I don't, know, are there many, I don't know if there are many Irish Jews, so probably not. Um, young gentleman, 12 years old, just pre-bar mitzvah age, uh, was born in Jerusalem and wanted to put on his passport that he was born in Israel. And apparently the United States State Department, the executive branch, does not recognize Jerusalem as being part of Israel. They recognize other cities, but Jerusalem, they Because the territory is in dispute. Right. Congress, however, in 2002, passed a, a statute, actually, that says if you're born in Jerusalem, you can have your passport stamped born in Israel. And when the gentleman and his family went to get their passport stamped, because he wanted it to say he was the born lad. in Israel, the young lad, <laughs> uh, the uh, State Department refused to do it. And they chose this case as the one to bring up 
this poor 12 year old kid he wanted his at the time i guess he was uh, 10 or whatever but the the interesting issue is it was a standard debate between the executive branch of government and the legislative branch it was all a separation of powers decision by the supreme court that the executive branch controls through the state department right. what countries were going to recognize and what countries were not going to recognize and they declared the statute of 2002 unconstitutional and it's actually a very interesting read. It's a 90-page opinion. I, I wouldn't recommend it to a non-lawyer, but if you feel if like you're reading, having trouble sleeping, sleeping at night, night it, it, I would say that the three pages of stereo instructions you could read in lieu of sleep might be better. <laughs> no, than I'm it. sorry. But it's an interesting stereo analysis. Stereo instructions? <laughs> you just completely <laughs> age yourself. They're going to tell me the eight-track manual? Right. <laughs> and and with, it comes with that little thing that says, do not eat, which yeah. I've never understood because <laughs> who opens, a stereo, who opens a stereo thinking there might be a pack of chocolates in there to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need to say do not eat on the little protective gel? Stereo but that's a separate instructions. issue. Stereo instructions. You're going to have to explain but to your daughter what a stereo is. Do they not call them <laughs> stereos anymore? <laughs> no. no not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's around the 8-track era. You know, I mean, I guess cassette tapes and all those things. Well, I'm sorry. So, look, what, what I, I had find... all the Beatles on 8-track. All the Beatles albums. <laughs> what I, I think you're right. What's interesting here, it shows the the dynamics between the, the, the government, or as you said, the executive branch, right? I think that the State Department falls, falls under, under the, the executive, executive branch. branch. And the obviously the legislative branch. And so... But was this case actually brought by the executive branch? No, no, the case was actually brought by the family of the 12-year-old child because the State Department gotcha. refused to stamp his passport as being born in Israel, which gives him certain dual citizenship rights and there are other issues there. Because he was an American citizen, his family was there for his birth, apparently. But it's a very interesting analysis of the difference of power between the executive and legislative branch. So and what was the decision? I missed that part. The decision was the, the statute passed by Congress in 2002, and it wasn't just a statute about Israeli citizenship. What happens is Congress sometimes passes statutes that have 50 different things By in them. By the way, I completely forgot. We actually have a picture of the Supreme Court for, for those of you oh. watching online. Um, and and the ho show hopefully could come up in a few. But go ahead, the statute. There it is. There, there's there's the support. nine happy. <laughs> oh, wow. So for those of you listening, it's a picture of the current nine Supreme Court justices. Uh, Neil, uh, bonus points if you can name all nine of them. Oh, please don't make <laughs> me do that. I've got Clarence Thomas, Anton Scalia, John Roberts. That's either Breyer or uh, Kennedy. Yeah, no, that's, no, no. Kennedy's in the back, I believe. That's Breyer. Unless I Kennedy think that's Kennedy. You think that's uh, yes, Kennedy? Yes, that's Kennedy. Goodness gracious. I'm going to guess that's Ginsburg. I mean. <laughs> you think? <laughs> an, an old Jewish-looking lady punched in the chair? Yeah, I think that's and Ginsburg. And then Kagan. Uh, and then that's um, the other Italian. Alito? Alito. Alito, yes. Breyer, Breyer, and um, Sotomayor. Sotomayor. There you go. It was, it was my well pronunciation done. okay? Well done. So, nice pop quiz. For those of you uh, uh, watching online, you can verify. But anyways, uh, we're coming up on the break. Uh, so far, we've been talking about some of the major headlines. I think the second half, we'll talk about some more headlines. And if we get some phone calls, we'll entertain those calls. If not, we'll make up our own questions to answer. There you go. All right. Attorney Confidential with Gus O'Neill. Back in a few. Attorney Confidential with Gus O'Neill is being brought to you by the law offices of Neil D. Kodsey and Bravo Law. Bravo Law is a business litigation firm known for providing common sense solutions to small businesses and individuals throughout South Florida. Mr. Bravo is rated AV by Martindale Hovell and Superb by ABBO, the highest ratings available from these two entities. The law offices of Neil D. Kotze is a litigation boutique with offices in Broward and Miami-Dade counties. Mr. Kotze is a veteran trial lawyer with nearly 25 years of jury trial experience. He is also a two-time recipient of the South Florida Daily Business Review's Most Effective Lawyer Award, a recipient of numerous awards for providing pro bono legal services and has been recognized by the National Law Council. Call our office, 786-464-0841 or 954-790-6711 and get informed. You're listening to Attorney Confidential with Gus and Neil. If you have a comment, question or just want to contribute to the conversation call the show at 888-565-1470 and share your thoughts on what's going on now back to gus and neil for more attorney confidential 
Welcome back to Attorney Confidential with Gus and Neil. Uh, 888-565-1470 for those of you who want to call and join in on the fun. Um, Neil, before the break, we were naming all the nine Supreme Court justices. I think you had an amendment there. You wanted to name them. <laughs> Change one to <laughs> John Marshall. Marshall. <laughs> Thur- <Thurgood>. John Marshall, <laughs> which would have been more. Yeah, when I was born, yes. yes. Thurgood Marshall, uh, Rehnquist. We all actually the ones are that are ourselves. We got them all nine right. Maybe not necessarily in the order. Breyer and Kennedy were a little bit up, you know, up in the air about, but the other ones we got it right. Right. So, anyways, uh, we're talking about some of the major headlines. I think now it's my turn. Uh, there was a recent lawsuit that was filed, and the headline here is. Litigious activist's latest cause, ending affirmative action at Harvard. So there's this conservative, <laughs> and I We're take on digs at each conservative other right. litigant. Uh, sometimes they're called trolls, right? They're the ones that, folks that just file, not not to offend anyone, but just the, the name du jour that they uh, Absolutely. assess to people. Fact, to, I'm dealing in a case one against a patent just, troll right now. Whose, yeah. whose role is just to file lawsuits. Right. Now, this particular conservative litigant um, is being backed by some fairly prominent conservative groups I mean emphasize conservative groups and 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 actually what they're really doing is they're trying to attack affirmative action and so they started first with the uh, University of Texas they brought a lawsuit on behalf of a white female student who had been denied admission claiming that because they chose other minorities who were less quote unquote qualified than her uh, she was being discriminated against but this one I thought was an interesting angle what he's done, what this individual has done, is brought a lawsuit on behalf of Asian Americans, claiming that they're te- technically a mi- part of minority group, that they're being discriminated against because their numbers are being kept low and the admissions rates to Harvard. Because Asian American students tend to be on the top end of the scores, standardized tests, and, and high academic achievers. So why would they be admitted less frequently? They are. There actually, there's a cap. Uh, it, it, it's it's there's a lot of Asian American qualified Asian American students that are not getting into these colleges in favor of other races or national. Or- yes. Wow. Yes. That's gonna be interesting. So it's an interesting angle because he's chosen two universities to file these lawsuits against. One is Harvard, obviously the name, probably the most recognized institution, and the next one is a state school, who you probably have some familiarity with. I'll give you one wild guess from somewhere in the South. You're not going to tell me it's my alma mater, are you? North Carolina. Oh, jeez. Because it's obviously they wanted to pick, and it's the same. It's right. a high, obviously high academic school, and then they run into the same, some of the same issues. But what I think it's interesting, this is an interesting use of the legal system to try to enact change, similar to what you dealt with the passport issue, is a use of the le- the courts to try to make some change. Now, what I also found interesting was the Asian American students and these uh, organizations that support them are actually against. They're not necessarily supporting this 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 act because they don't want to have their names brought into this litigation. Well, that's interesting. Now, the other minority groups, the Hispanic and the African American minority groups, are actually yeah you know, coming in as a third party into this lawsuit because they're saying, "Look, it's going to directly affect us if this person's successful." So. If you want to know more about and learn more about this this case, there's a website that the person put on. Uh, now it's called HarvardNotFair.org, and I think we have a picture of. I took a picture of the homepage that should be coming up shortly. There it is, HarvardNotFair.org, where this individual is trying to solicit clients. And, and, and for those of you that are listening, uh, I have a picture up there, literally from the website. That's my phone, by the way. You see the 62% of my battery was doing okay that day. You see the time that I took it. It's just a screenshot. But it says, we're, this is the homepage. Were you denied admission to Harvard? It may be because you're the wrong race. And he goes on to say, Harvard is a great university, and we know it's tough to be admitted. But Harvard continues to use an applicant's race and ethnicity as admission criteria, even though a 2013 U.S. Supreme Court decision essentially forbids these practices. And so there, and then if you go on further and ask them to uh, submit their information and whatnot. But look, politics aside, I, I think the, the issue here is it's a creative use of, of the court system to try to enact some change. But it also raises some very interesting legal issues about affirmative action 
and whatnot, which I know we can devote a whole time. Yeah, I mean, what's what's interesting is I, I was, was doing a presentation, God, it's been about eight months now, on employment issues, and somebody asked me about reverse discrimination, they call it. Correct. And I'm going to age myself there because uh, I think Even that, more so than before. Well, exactly. But I think that we've come to a point in society where that's a misnomer. I think that as I look at my daughter who's... 11 years old. You almost and forgot the age. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're saying, pause. Right, I had to pause 11 years old. Um, my kids are 12 and 10. Right, exactly. I know that. You know that off the top of your head. That's why mine's 11 because she's in between. But the issue is they don't look at race like the people growing up 20, 30 years ago. Right. Unfortunately, and I grew up in the South where people looked at race. But I think that when you get to the point where my daughter's on a jury and the law says you can't discriminate on the basis of race, that someone who, whether they be white, Asian, Latin American, African American, they're all going to be viewed equally. If you go back 20 years, white people weren't suing for race discrimination. It's not because the statute didn't protect them. It was because primarily 20 years ago, it was the African Americans who were yeah, being discriminated look, this against. Is a, this is a topic and, that, I, again, we could spend hours on. Right. And I think I think what's interesting about this is, again, it's a, to me, was the use of the court system to try and act some change. I mean, e e using yep. the same tools Absolutely. that led to affirmative action in the, same, in the first place. Now, the one quote that I got here that I think you'll appreciate is that the actual the, the litigious conservative is a white Jew. Oh, God. <laughs> and so there's a quote here from from an uh, Asian American group. He said, it took a Jewish white guy to start this case. <laughs> Anyways, we'll move on, because I think that could be a very sensitive topic, probably not as sensitive as balls, but, but, but you know, pretty close to it. <laughs> I know you offended some people last week, and if you want to plead a mea culpa, here's your chance. No, well, I have no <laughs> Bruce, Caitlin, if I offended you, uh, you know, that's why you, you put, when you put yourself in the limelight with the Kardashians, you put yourself in the limelight. He's changed it from a K to a C. Could have been Caitlin with a K, did it with a C. Right. Very strategic. Anyways, since seeing right. that there are no calls yet, let's go to some questions that we have to, we can oh, address see, in the few minutes the, that we have let's left. Let's see, we have the AVO questions. Um, I, I actually thought this was interesting because it relates to uh, something we've talked about on a previous show. Here's a question that was on AVO. Uh, my attorney is threatening me. If I stop there, it would be a bad thing. But my attorney <laughs> is threatening me that it, he will resign from my case if I don't accept the current settlement proposal. I told him I don't want to accept. He has told me that he will resign even though trial is just three months away. Can anyone help me? Is he allowed to do this? And it goes back to... And the comments are, are pretty good here, and we'll go through some of those. But if you have an attorney that's that adamant that you should accept the settlement proposal, we need to step back to what the attorney-client relationship is because it is founded in trust. And if you don't trust the recommendation of your lawyer, then there's an issue there. Now, I will say that when it comes to settlement, it's always going to be the client's decision whether to settle. And if it's a close call, sometimes the attorney won't even make a recommendation. But if your case is worth $10 and you're being offered 20 <laughs> and we'll use low numbers, if your attorney's telling you settle, 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 you have to sometimes think what he's doing. And a couple of great answers I thought for some of the lawyers were, um, he absolutely has the right to decline to take your case to trial if you will not settle. It is a business decision for the lawyer. However, if he is a reputable attorney and tries other cases, but does not want to take yours to trial, he may be signal signaling something to you about your case. Right. And and really the best answer came from a lawyer in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, which is, I love the sarcasm here. Sure, he can resign. He's your paid expert, not an indentured servant. <laughs> <laughs> if you are not following his best legal advice, he should resign and very, allow you to find another lawyer. Very, very true. That said make better darn sure that you actually have a strong case and there are attorneys willing to pick up the gauntlet <laughs> which will be much harder as the trial date is approaching <laughs> that's I a good way of the exactly. gauntlet because what they're going to get now here's a question i found that i got uh, interested said my employer hired me stating employees make 600 to 1000 dollars per week my first week i worked 56 and presumably hours and i was paid less than minimum wage uh the check has no hours indicated but commission of 300 dollars can these people legally get away with this unfair pay practice? This was a question from someone in actually Pompano Beach, Florida. Well, interesting. If you're being made, paid less than the minimum wage, the answer is no. I mean, the, and uh, Florida actually has a minimum wage that's a little bit higher than the feds. 
So there were a couple answers to this question. There was one by a gentleman, Mark Siegel, um, in Sarasota. Another question that I thought was absolutely the worst one said, even jobs paid on commission typically have to comply with the minimum wage laws. I would need more information regarding your specific job in order to give you a full answer. You should contact an employment attorney. Most employment attorneys, like myself, provide an initial free consultation. <laughs> Do you recognize that answer? <laughs> that has to be a long time ago, though. I don't remember This answering. was one Neil David Kotze <laughs> plantation floor. <laughs> Absolute worst, what, worst answer. What is the, it's consistent with what I said now. And t what's the date on that? Because that's got to be. This is uh, 2013. Two th <laughs> it, it looks like my opinion hasn't changed in two years. <laughs> I thought it was interesting when that I was doing a search. That's funny. And I found that. I, you know, classic disclaimer. All right. Last question that I have, because I think we're again coming close yeah, to the end. we've been given the two-minute warning. Can I sue someone for insulting me? A vet wrote in a record that my mother has hysteria. <laughs> And the best answer was, was to me was, have you been insulted? Is this a veterinar veterinarian writing in dog's medical record? <laughs> Perhaps you could clarify. <laughs> so anyways, one minute. Uh, you got a 30 second. I'll give you a uh, 10, second, have have take 10, away. Second. 10 second takeaway. Um, my and takeaway is uh, the advice that a good lawyer gives in 2013 will not change from <laughs> the advice that same good lawyer gives in 2015. All I right. wonder and, who that is. And I think we're ready for the picture <laughs> on the closing, the deep thought of the day. Okay, so this is a fortune cookie that simply says, Confucius says, if you think we're going to sum up your whole life on this little bit of paper, you're crazy. For those of you looking for answers on fortune cookies, you may want to look elsewhere. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> tune again next week to Attorney Confidential with Gus and Neil. Good night. <laughs> you have been listening to Attorney Confidential with Gus Bravo and Neil Kotze two rated AV trial attorneys with over 40 years of experience. Tune in next week for another episode of entertainment, insight, and just plain fun. That's Monday, 6 p.m. on WNN, 1470 a.m. See you next Monday for more Attorney Confidential. The opinions expressed.